you. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Gray, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be speaking to you again after a few months. Uh, first time we talked about intermittent fasting, and uh, this time we'll be talking ab about strength and protein. So I know you're all into fitness with, uh, with Gray, so I will just want to give you a bit of a, a different perspective uh, around the fitness world. So let me share my screen um, and we can get cracking. Um, so first of all, let me see this, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's keep it interactive, first of all. So you can actually uh, just um, interrupt me. I'll do, in any case, a, a few pauses throughout the, the presentation and um, we can have really a nice chat. There is also a little questionnaire in a sec. Um, which we wanted to do, but we did not. So uh, we'll just uh, use the chat um, and uh, go forward uh, from there. So without any further ado, so the topic of the day, the need for strength. So, and just to uh, just set the expectations uh, to everyone that uh, strength and muscle is not about bodybuilders. I think it's important for all of us. Uh, and in the same sense, we actually all need uh, enough protein so we can thrive and be healthy and functional. And we'll discuss more about that. So let me see if I can change my, yeah. Okay, so first of all, who I am for the people who don't know me, my name is uh, Panayotis Kotas. I'm a founder of Keton Track and I'm a certified nutritional coach. Um, my interests are mostly around uh, the ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, and fitness. Uh, I practice all of these things um, in my lifestyle, but also with all the clients I coach. And uh, I also specifically have a, a interest in um, insulin sensitivity. I think it's uh, very important that we take care of it as in order to be healthy and not also as part of the ketogenic diet, also cholesterol, LDL, etc. So these are my more um, intense interest this moment. Um, I'm also, uh, or I had the honor to be featured um, in the um, New York uh, Journal as one of the 30 coaches. And also uh, I'm coaching uh, instead on not only a personal coaching, but I'm coaching also teams and bigger organizations to improve their um, performance, work performance, because I think it's really uh, important to take care of ourselves in order to be able to achieve the best we want in life and in our work environment. Um, so let's move to the topic. First of all, let's do a little icebreaker. So. I introduced already the topic, it's about strength training, uh, but do we really need muscle, right? So uh, is that something that is important for you? So maybe we can, uh, in the absence of a poll, maybe you can um, type uh, in the chat uh, your thoughts, like yes, no, not really, or whatever that is, and uh, we can get going. So are you trying to build muscle at the moment? And um, also second question, how much protein do you really eat at the moment? So, I mean, no, don't put any grams, just a lot, too much, little, et cetera. So just to, to get you thinking about the, the two topics we'll be discussing. Um, and I'll open also my chat here. Yeah, so, okay. So everyone seems to be on a yes. So I guess yes on trying to build muscle. So I think that this session will be also useful for you as well. And maybe you can also contribute to the discussion as to the practices you do to in order to build muscle. Mm -hmm. um, I hear someone saying getting older and losing muscle. So that's uh, very, very important. We'll be discussing about this. And um, yeah, a person says, don't know how much protein to eat and probably I don't eat enough. And that's actually very uh, important. 
uh, not in relation to um, only to, pro, uh, to strength, but also to our uh, health and longevity. Yeah, someone said uh, that uh, protein, uh, no one is deficient in protein in the Western society. Uh, let's see, I would argue that many of us are actually, uh, but again, we'll see the numbers a bit later on. Okay, cool. I think uh, animal protein much more, more about bioavailable. Yep, that's for sure. Okay, so I, I hope you I got uh, everyone engaged and uh, you know focused on the presentation um, and a lot of uh, interesting topics. And again, please interrupt me if you have any questions. I'll do in any case some pauses throughout so we can uh, really um, have a nice. Time. So uh, let me see if I can go to the next slide. Uh, there. So first of all, uh, let's talk about muscle, right? So I think uh, from the answers, we can all agree that muscle is important and it helps us to be functional and healthy. So we're not talking about really muscles like big guns, uh, maybe what uh, this person here thinks uh, he has, uh, but uh, we're talking really from a, a health perspective and that's how I will approach this, uh, this discussion. So first of all, uh, uh, muscle increases our bone density very important. Uh, we saw the comment about osteopenia. Um, it also uh, improves joint function, heart health. So having actually healthy muscles also improves our heart function and reduces the risk of injury. And that's independent of what uh, age we are, but especially as we get older and older. Right. So actually hip fractures is one of the deadliest uh, um, causes as we get older and in the age range, I think of 70 to uh, 80 plus. So it's important to be, uh, to have muscle in order to be functional and healthy. And we'll discuss about these points uh, also um, in a few minutes. So I would say that actually the choice first of all is ours. All right, so that's a, a key message I'm always trying to convey to people that uh, we have the choice of obviously how we grow old, but uh, how we, if we put on muscle and how functional our body is. And here uh, we have the example of two ladies, which are actually of the same age. So the lady on the left is pretty famous in the wellness space and she's 74 years old. So, uh, and she looks uh, pretty healthy. And I wouldn't attribute that only to exercise, probably she's doing a lot more things, but uh, having um, muscle, not bodybuilder muscle, just muscle to be functional and healthy, I think is a really important uh, point. So the choice is ours. So, and how does um, muscle work, right? So you guys are all uh, quite uh, into cardio. I don't know how uh, for sure, since you're working with, uh, with Gray, um, but, uh, Muscles work in different ways. So depending on the exercise we do, they also actually tend to develop differently. So we have three type of fibers. So first of all, we have a fiber type one, which we also call a slow tissue. And uh, this is red. And the fact it's red, it has a lot of uh, more uh, red blood cells because it carries a lot more oxygen, uh, and a lot more hemoglobin, and it has a lot more mitochondria. The reason it has a lot more, more mitochondria, which is uh, the cell's um, energy factory, is because uh, it's, it needs to support aerobic um, respiration, which is activities that we do with low intensity for big periods of time. So that's actually what we call low intensity contraction. Whoever does running um, in steady pace uh, then primarily uses fiber type one. Uh, if, on the other hand, we go to fiber type two, I'll skip uh, 2A for a sec, is, um, is a type of fiber which is more white uh, because it doesn't carry so much oxygen. So again, um, so many uh, hemoglobins, 
uh, and it doesn't uh, create um, so much energy. So it's a slower energy, but uh, something that is relying on anaerobic uh, metabolism, which uh, we usually typically so 100 meter run, or if we lift some heavy weights. So there are different types uh, of muscle being uh, muscle fibers being used depending on the exercise. Um, and in this case, um, we will be talking a bit about how more to utilize uh, fiber type two. And the, the middle one type um, fiber type 2A is something which is a hybrid, so something in between. So people who are maybe doing triathlon and doing not so extensive um, uh, cardio work, but also at the same time, they're uh, working uh, on uh, build, not building muscle, but actually training uh, their muscle through some uh, difficult uh, um, uh, exercises. So um, this is kind of the basis. Uh, and I'll go to um, resistance training. So and I'll skip um, the, the section about cardio now, but uh, we go uh, to resistance training and why I think it's quite important to complement with uh, a, a cardio um, session uh, throughout the week. So first of all, resistance training is associated with increased muscle mass. Uh, but from a health perspective, uh, it's also associated and, and with uh, insulin sensitivity. Let me actually just say that uh, these are um, benefits of resistance training, which we'll discuss now, which are uh, bigger or in research uh, have better output when doing resistance training with regards to cardio, right? So it's a bit of a uh, comparison, if you may, um, which, um, um, yeah, I want to, to convey to you. So first of all, insulin sensitivity. So having bigger muscles actually uh, acts as a sugar or glucose uh, fuel, uh, or it sucks uh, glucose uh, throughout the day. So when we're doing an actually an exercise, which does not uh, um, require insulin, still our muscles, because are bigger, will suck up uh, all the glucose that we have in our um, body, in our liver, and it will make us more insulin sensitive. So from a health perspective, uh, being insulin sensitive is very important and having uh, bigger muscles, I do, uh, resistance training will help in that direction. Uh, bone density uh, is very also important where as we age uh, and from a pretty young age, so uh, when after 40 years old, for every year of our life, we're losing about 1% uh, uh, of our bone density and similar to our muscle. So we need to um, train uh, in a manner that actually uh, flexes our bones, uh, uh, compresses our bones. Um, and the best exercise here to do is, for example, uh, jumps uh, or uh, lift heavy things. So uh, on the other hand, cardio actually tends to reduce bone density. So we need to be um, very aware of this fact. Um, the same way, uh, increased muscle mass actually helps us uh, not only uh, with uh, osteopenia, but also with sarcopenia. In the same way, as we age, we lose uh, muscle mass and we really want to maintain it, if not increase it. Uh, uh, so again, resistance training is a very important um, protocol that we should include in our, um, in our daily life. Um, also, uh, longevity and uh, reduced mortality is something that from a research uh, perspective, uh, it is a lot more uh, beneficial to be strong uh, in order basically to avoid uh, injuries as we get older because of uh, having weak muscles. So fragility is a important uh, metric of, um, of uh, longevity. And uh, of course, we, we want to be mobile, strong muscles uh, help us be mobile. And when I say mobile, it's not only about running, walking, for example, being able to bend down, 
uh, so having strong uh, back, strong lower back to be able to uh, do all the functions that we want in uh, in a daily uh, in a day. And last but not least, resistance training is actually uh, very important for fat loss. So um, and here most people might think the the opposite that when you're actually doing long long periods of cardio, you're um, losing fat, but actually the, the body becomes quite adapt to running. Uh, so the output you have in terms of your metabolic rate actually decreases as you get accustomed to running. So there you have uh, the need to probably increase the, the time you run, which is counterproductive. Uh, and on the other hand, also when you do resistance training, uh, the, the afterburn effect of trying to build bigger muscles uh, lasts uh, up to two days. So you're actually, your muscles are uh, repairing and growing for two, three days after the exercise. And this, uh, uh, this translates also to an increased metabolic rate, uh, which helps um, with fat loss. So quite a lot of uh, benefits, which uh, I, probably would argue or kind of unique to resistance training. Um, so uh, what does it mean? Um, first of all, that resistance training means that we want to train to our near maximum. Uh, so to engage as much of muscle fiber as we can uh, of type of type 2A, but also uh, of type 1. Um, and this translates into having um, lower rep range. So a lot of people, when they're starting, they're doing 15, 20 reps, uh, but that will eventually exhaust uh, the muscle, but it also takes longer time. So we can achieve the, the same output if we're doing five to eight reps for two to four sets and then have adequate rest. So we're not really talking about heat, whereas you have, um, high intensity interval training, uh, where you have five, 10 seconds of intervals. We're talking really about um, putting strain on your muscle, resting, and then uh, doing the same exercise in a very short uh, rep range. Um, and the, the, the amount of, uh, I didn't put it here in the slide, but the amount of uh, exercise that we, we would need, or I would suggest, uh, doesn't need to be um, daily. I mean, it can be complemented with a proper uh, cardio uh, protocol. Uh, so maybe you can exercise two or three times a week for 30 minutes. That should be sufficient uh, for anyone who is not a professional, I guess. Um, I'll make a small pause here and um, just ask if anyone wants to uh, comment on something or ask something uh, or just uh, we can have a little couple of minutes of discussion. There are yeah. questions Kerry. coming in in the chat. So, oh, sorry, Kerry, I think, yeah, Kerry had a question in the chat. She's put her hand up. So, Kerry. Hi, it's a uh, guy, actually. How are you doing? Uh, so, thanks very much for, oh, no worries. It's okay. It often happens. Thanks very much for today's talk. I had a question just about the muscle fiber types. Um, I'm intrigued. Is there any way of knowing which kinds of muscle fiber the person has, even by looking at how the muscles present? Or is that something that's a little bit more kind of like uh, cutting somebody open to have a look at, just as a matter of interest? I, I think if you look at anyone who runs 10K uh, on a regular basis, then you can say that he he's a lot more lean, but also less uh, muscular, right? Muscular in the sense of size of the muscle, right? So pretty healthy, but uh, the, the, the more strength you or the more weight you're carrying or more weight you're lifting, then your muscles would actually tend to grow. So there okay. is, um, I think okay. that would be the easy way. Thanks. And am I right in saying that we, we, you have a combination, everybody has a combination of all muscle fiber types. Some people are just more prone to fast twitch. Uh, more prone to slow twitch. Yes, exactly. So that's something we we all carry. It's just uh, we tend to usually train uh, different parts. Uh, I have also a question from Peter here. So please, should I go? Should I answer that? Yep. Yeah, please. That's going to be resistance training, training without weight. 
Yeah, so actually I never trained with weights. So personally speaking, that's my little thing. I like doing calisthenics. And the reason I like doing calisthenics is because I mean, due to Corona, but not only, I think it's, uh, I don't like taking the car and going to the gym, uh, a lot of wasted time. So I train at home um, and I train uh, with my body weight. So, and there are many, many exercises uh, that uh, also we'll, we'll discuss about it a bit more uh, later on uh, that we can do with our own body weight. So we can increase intensity even from a simple push-up to an exercise that uh, you can actually do only five reps of a, a push-up. Um, I usually tend to combine it also with uh, yoga because I want to keep that flexibility and functional part as well. Um, and um, yeah, the, the only thing that uh, uh, you really need if you're training without weights is a pull-up bar or a set of rings uh, and you can pretty do uh, everything you, you actually need. And your, your body is weight, isn't it? When you think about it, it's your, your body weight. Standing, in a way, is resistance training because you're having resistance against, against the ground. Um, the question yeah. in, uh, Pedro is asking, what about Metcon? I've never heard of Metcon. I don't know what Metcon is. What's Metcon, Paniotis? <laughs> I don't know either, Pedro, so maybe you can... Pedro, jump uh, in and, and chat and, and tell, yeah, us, so, tell us what Med, Metcon is. Can you, can you guys hear us? Yes. 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 So, Kerry, I so thought Kerry was. Because... Hi, Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Pedro. Because you mentioned HIT, hit training. Hello. <laughs> you, you mentioned HIT, but, but HIT is usually without... Uh, as I understand it is without, it's like a lot of body weight, but Metcon is, is closer to where you use barbells and a little bit of a heavier load to do your exercises. Yeah. So, so is uh, that part of, you know, is that beneficial as you get older to use barbell work? I actually think uh, that's why here we're talking about also resistance training and not heat. Hit, um, I think it's somewhere in between uh, resistance training and cardio. So uh, and can and and will put a lot of strain and even more strain that I would actually recommend, depending on your goals and fitness, of course, uh, on also your heart, right? So combination of barbells and uh, doing uh, basically thirty minutes of exercise with very minimum um, rest will get your heart rate to one hundred and eighty in seconds right and we'll keep it there for a quite uh, long time so whereas resistance training has a bigger rest time so one to three minutes you really recuperate you lower your heart rate you bring down your breath so you really uh kind of get your energy back in order and you can do then uh, the next set so um i think uh heat can be tricky uh, and you and Gray and you guys all know it probably better than me that we need to be guided by breath and being out of breath, uh, which can very easily be done if you're having a heavy weight and doing uh, cardio at the same time. Um, I think needs to be uh, done very carefully unless you're 20 years old, which is okay, completely different discussion. <laughs> Elle had a question actually as well about who was the the seventy year old lady, the fitness trainer. Was she a trainer or was she a coach or? Well, was this a question to me? No. Yes, Elle was. Elle was asking. Yeah, it's that. It's who, that. Who was the lady, the seventy year old? Is that Elle there, Elle? Ah, oh, I don't remember her name. Uh, out of um, out of my head, but I'll I'll post it uh, uh, after the chat. So um, she's um, she's English, I think, and uh, she's quite famous because she actually transformed herself from uh, in a late age, and uh, she became uh, or she she brought about this uh, physique. Yeah, I'd like to Google her, so I'll I'll sure, sure. I'll, I'll get the name for you. We'll find it. Keith is asking, can osteopenia be reversed with resistance training? Yes, it can. 
not only with resistance training, I think nutrition would be a very important part of it. Of it. Uh, but yes, so, uh, and the best extra is here, uh, going back to, uh, to basically doing body weight training, is that uh, you jump. Uh, so if you do anything that uh, includes just trying to jump high uh, or doing from a squat position some jumps, uh, that really, in terms of um, leg bone density, that's the best exercise you can do. Um, and yes, in any case, the answer is yes. And Christine is doing a little bit of research on back-end research there. So she's put, uh, the, the lady is called Ernestine Shepherd. Exactly. There you go. Thanks for that. <laughs> Brill. I don't think we've got any more questions at this point. So I think perhaps if you want to crack on. Okay, good. Uh, let me move on. Right. So, um, how do we grow muscle? So, uh, maybe a term that you you haven't heard um, so far, and that's uh, through our primary mechanism is actually mTOR, uh, and mTOR is a protein kinase uh, which acts as a fuel sensor and actually it monitors our uh, energy status. So obviously we grow muscle through resistance training, but here I want to bring another perspective uh, just as in transition to protein as well, that uh, in order to grow, we need to have the right uh, activators. So the body doesn't grow only uh, because we are uh, putting strain on it. So we'll try to grow, but it also needs other factors and in the other factors that we uh, will also trigger uh, mTOR. So we want actually that anabolic effect. So when we're trying to create muscle, we're trying to grow, right? So we need that anabolic effect and we need to trigger mTOR uh, to sufficient amounts uh, in order to help that pr uh, muscle protein system synthesis. So mTOR now, um, just to look at, let's look at the graph for a sec. So uh, if we don't have enough mTOR activa activation, then we'll, we're wasting muscle. Uh, if we have too much, like excessive growth, but that's a topic for another potentially uh, lunch and learn, is that we, we are more prone to cancer because cancer is something that actually is a uh, manifestation of excess growth potentially. Uh, so we want to have the right mTOR uh, activation, but if we do achieve uh, to trigger mTOR every single day at the right amount, uh, this also helps in many, many other ways. So it is used to repair DNA. It's used obviously for protein synthesis, which we want. It creates stronger immune. It helps with insulin sensitivity and it's uh, the key uh, protein kinase around everything that has to do with uh, anabolism. So we have anabolism and catabolism. Uh, we have our flight and flight uh, uh, system, and we have our rest and digest system. So mTOR is a key to our fight or flight. And, and uh, in this case, resistance training specifically uh, helps to activate mTOR in the brain and in our nerve cells. So the more more uh, strain we put on our muscles, uh, the more we help uh, to activate those in the right places. So to activate mTOR in our brain and nerve cells, but not actually in the fat or liver cells. So it actually works exactly where we want uh, for health reasons. Uh, so we don't want excessive growth in our fat or liver. And that's why I also mentioned before insulin sensitivity. So mTOR is a part of, uh, is at the focus of a lot of research at the moment. Um, and um, yeah, I would uh, urge you to have a look uh, on this. And because it's really multifaced, this is really uh, just one little uh, um, part of what mTOR really does. So um, to go to protein now, so we actually need 
protein, right? So we all not know that. Um, but protein, first of all, just to relate it, is um, activating. When we eat protein, we're activating mTOR. So that's a one-to-one -one relation. Uh, from protein, we actually want um, 22 amino acids. Essential or nine? And essential means that, that we need to get them from our diet because our body cannot make them up. So the other uh, 13, uh, the body uh, can make them up, but obviously it's easier if we uh, uh, take them from food. So uh, here the, the trick is that we want always to stimulate enough protein synthesis or more protein synthesis than uh, protein breakdown. And that's uh, really important um, in order to have muscle. If we break down, so if we do excessive, for example, fasting, then uh, we really uh, break down protein, break down at the end also uh, muscle. Um, and here one key of uh, one key uh, amino acid. So they're not all equal. So we're saying okay, we're getting our protein. Uh, that's actually not true because um, further some of the proteins or some of the amino acids are actually more important than others. Here the key one is leucine. Leucine is one of the brown chain amino acids, so one of three. Um, and leucine is uh, a vital amino acid for muscle protein synthesis, and it's more potent into eggs. So hence the, the picture. Hmm. Um, so here, uh, I think uh, this is now important, and a couple of you uh, hinted to that with uh, certain questions, is how much protein do we need? Right, so and we need a lot more than we think uh, because the current RDA is 0 0.8 grams of protein per uh, kilogram of body weight. Um, and here just to uh, say that uh, we need a lot more, first of all, because we cannot store it. So it's either use it or lose it. And uh, we, we can eat a lot more as well because uh, the body will buffer it, will still will not throw it away. Maybe some of it will be create uh, will be turned um, through a process called gluconeogenesis into sugar. That's also not a bad thing because it will not create really a, a blood a blood sugar spike um, in this scenario. And the current research of this RDA, which I mentioned, is actually under revision and in most uh, um, current research papers is stated as insufficient. And uh, the latest literature refers to um, the minimum, and that's, uh, I would say, around about or even the minimum, depending on the type of training you do, is that we want double that. So we want 1.6 grams of protein for every kilo uh, of body weight. Uh, okay, if you're obese, or if you have too many kilos, uh, I would say, uh, I wouldn't go with lean body weight, but in any case we can, for a normal weight portion, uh, that number would stand. And we can even um, see in literature uh, references to having 3.3 as the maximum. I mean, at some point there is a, um, you, there is a, how do you call it? Um, you lose the benefits of having too much. So 1.6 is really the, the, what we really need and our body needs in, in terms of, uh, really having uh, the proper building blocks. And when I say building blocks, it's on, not only for muscle, it's for everything we do in our uh, body. So our uh, protein is the building block of our cells and we need them for so many fu functions. Um, now, someone will ask, how do I get 1.6 uh, or uh, in distributed in my meals? So. The one key number here or another key number is 30 grams of protein or more per meal. Uh, why is that? Is because in order to create the right um, anabolic effect and stimulate protein synthesis, we need uh, around about three grams, uh, 2.5 to three grams of leucine. And uh, in order to trigger uh, or to, to ingest three grams of leucine, you need around about of 30 grams of protein uh, um, of protein coming from animal sources. 
So 30 grams of protein, uh, if, we, if we think about chicken, for example, which is usually popular, uh, we can consider uh, 120 grams. Uh, so a, a normal size chicken breast would be, uh, would have uh, 30 grams of protein. The rest in meat usually is, um, is water. So, um, so you going to that amount of so having a medium sized steak actually gives you what you need. Um, so some more considerations when it comes to, to protein. First of all, and it was mentioned in the questions, is that animal protein is a better source of protein from plant sources. Uh, what does that mean, better? First of all, there are many uh, plant sources, for example, rice, um, does not come with all nine essential amino acids. So that's usually why people who actually go with um, more plant-based uh, diets, vegetarians, uh, tend to combine carbs. So you would eat beans together with rice in order to get all nine essential amino acids. <clears throat> the other consideration is the amount, right? So at least that's my personal opinion here. Um, since also I, uh, I think we can do a ketogenic uh, lifestyle and diet with, uh, with plant uh, sources, but it's, it's more difficult to do that. And when it comes to protein, um, well, it's quite difficult. But the point is that you need a lot more amounts of food in order to get that um, 30 grams of protein in your single meal. So it's, it's, I think it's pound for pound, animal sources are a lot better, whereas you would need to get maybe three cups of beans and rice, which is a lot of not only calories, but a lot of volume to eat to get that 30 uh, grams of protein. Um, protein is uh, from all the, the three micronutrients, so carbs, fat, and protein. Protein is the, the best satiety factor. Uh, so I would say always start every meal with protein. So choose your protein source, whatever that is, animal or plant, but start with that. So um, usually we tend to fill uh, our plate with pasta and then put some protein on top. I would say start with protein and see how much uh, space is left there for, for your pasta. Um, and you will feel a lot more satiated. You'll get more uh, or less calories, all the protein you need. Uh, and that actually helps also directly and indirectly with, with fat loss. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's answer some questions if you guys want. Julie's got a question just going back to the, um, when you mentioned about jumping uh, to yeah. help in terms of, of um, resistance training, what can you do if you need to do low impact um, so you, so you, you're not advised to be jumping. So is there any sort of like resistance training that is good for, I think we were talking about osteopenia and osteoporosis. Is there any resistance training that is good for that? That isn't jumping. Squatting as well. Would just do the same thing or similar. What was I missed that? Sorry. Uh, squatting would do squatting. a similar thing. And I'm you can fine. do squatting in again, various, um, um, types of squatting so you can do also pistol squats so and that would not only train your muscle but also uh, put a lot of strain because you're putting all your weight on that one limb so um, squatting is also uh, quite good I'm thinking also um, in, in the Qigong practice that we do we do sort of like shaking and actually shaking and, and banging your, banging maybe is the wrong word to put it, but uh, hitting your heels on the ground. So you're really creating that resistance. So I would think that's, for me, I sort of like sense that is as good as sort of like doing a jump. Yeah, yeah. Anything we do with regard shaking, shaking is good actually. Uh, Elle asked a really interesting mm -hmm. question way at the back at the beginning actually, and it was about, no, I had not heard of any doctors um, treating protein deficiency, but I was just literally Googling what are the symptoms of protein deficiencies. But if you look at the symptoms of protein deficiency, like muscle loss, things like that, 
um, weaker bones. So you've ob you obviously are seeing protein deficiency affecting people. It's maybe not necessarily that people are spotting it as protein deficiency. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Paniotis. Um, okay, so uh, how, I mean, personally, how would you, uh, in your, to your person, how you would spot it? First of all, if you have, if you try to do exercise, uh, then you just simply see, you will have difficulty uh, having energy or uh, growing your perform or improving your performance. Uh, if you have, uh, if you, and but this is a bit, uh, let's say controversial because usually people who uh, train uh, seriously actually take care of your, of their protein amounts. That's pe why people also have uh, supplements or whey proteins, etc. Uh, if someone is not really uh, considering uh, their protein, uh, I think that, uh, that there is a big group in the vegetarian community who is actually having problems um, getting enough protein, just because it, it's uh, per se more difficult to get uh, uh, that amount of protein. And that actually manifests in uh, things like breaking nails, uh, mm. losing hair mm. so uh, when you don't get enough protein you don't get uh, also enough zinc enough selenium so um, these things will create deficiencies uh, which uh, also will affect uh, how you look so also our skin is full of protein right so if you uh, we, we change the skin uh, we, we lose skin or if you're losing weight uh, and then you have loose skin all these things um, protein has a role into them. So it's, it's a bit like the breath work is you go to a GP and they're never gonna say oh, you've got dysfunctional breathing. So they might be treating the, the symptoms of skin, nails, weight, uh, weight loss or muscle weight, but the muscle loss, but they're not necessarily gonna say, oh, it's a protein deficiency, I think is what the point well, that we're highlighting there. Some really yeah. good questions. Please do feel free to put your hand up and, and talk and come on screen yourself because I'm just sat here reading your, all these questions up. Give me a rest. Flicky's asking about what about fish? Fish is protein, presumably. Yeah, uh, yeah fish is a great uh, source of protein. It's uh, gram per gram, it's a bit lower. Has a, fish has a bit lower uh, protein uh, than um, beef, for example. But uh, yeah, we should actually include the... Uh, fish on a weekly basis yeah and Ellie is, is asking would you change the amount of protein intake on training days i would suggest then it depends on what type of training you're doing but would you vary your protein intake depending on what type of training what type of exercise that you're doing okay so if, if we if we try to be uh, scientific about it i would say yes but on the other hand, um, I would argue just for me also, nutrition is not, needs to be intuitive. So just feel your hunger. Your body will probably tell you I need more food. As long as you start with protein as well, if you're really hungry or you, your muscles are needing it and you start putting your protein, you will probably stop as when you see that, uh, okay, that's probably enough protein for me. So uh, the mind is actually quite clever and it will... Uh, it will regulate itself. So, and again, as we said, you can go higher with no problems. There is no really side effects uh, unless you have a issue with your kidney. Um, so yeah, yes, but listen to yourself. Listen to really your intuition. That's fascinating, isn't it? How many times when all of these launch and learns and everything we're working on in terms of breath work and fitness, and at the end of the day, it all comes back to your body knows best, listen, listen to your body. And, and we can almost overrule that and be thinking too much about stuff. Uh, Pedro is asking, it sounds tricky enough to get protein if you're on an all veg diet. Do you have any recommendations for good veg sources of protein? Yeah, um, basically one, to be honest, and that's tofu. So I'm not uh, practicing um, uh, vegetarian diets, but I am in contact with uh, many uh, people who are um, following that lifestyle. And um, a few people I have coached, not fully vegan, uh, vegetarians, but uh, wanting less meat. Uh, the one source that uh, has the best um, 
um, an, a protein to car uh, to calories ratio is tofu. Brilliant. And I mean, eggs, I hope all vegetarians, uh, except I guess vegans, would kind of be okay to eat some eggs. Christine is asking, is this recommended for diabetics? I presume in terms of protein uh, balance? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, um, totally. So, um, and we, and uh, Christine, I don't know if that's for you or it's a generic question. We can have a chat offline if you want. But um, diabetics, um, if, if you have diabetes or if you have high blood sugars, what you want is actually to reduce your sugar, right? So, um, and uh, that's why I believe that ketogenic lifestyle is actually a lot more easier to cure uh, such a state, reduce insulin resistance. Um, and first of all, what we want to control is our hunger. So be able to, in an easy, safe way, reduce sugar. And when I'm talking about sugar, I'm talking about really snacks, cookies, and all the things which actually, first of all, uh, cause cravings and cause uh, us to get off track, let's say. So uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, and if you if you look at any CGM, that's the continuous glucose monitor, and you have just a steak, you'll see your um, glucose basically stay, stay um, at the same level before, throughout, and after your meal. Uh, and that's uh, that's a mechanism that um, uh, I could explain offline to you if you want. But the answer is yes. Um, I was just thinking that the 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 podcast you did with Dan Saladino, he's I think there's part of the way through that he's talking to. I've forgotten the doctor up in the north of England is talking about diabetics and ketogenic diet as well, isn't he? Yeah. So I actually I, I am a strong believer, and maybe uh, Gray, we can do another. Um, little uh, session for uh, ketogenic lifestyle, but I'm a strong believer of fat adaptation. Uh, now we're looking a bit uh, off topic, but fat adaptation means that we're able to use our own body fat for energy. Okay, and that's why I mean I did not include it here in this um, in, in this uh, presentation, but also um, there are a lot of um, uh, research uh, with people, not so much at the moment, but a lot. Uh, starting to build up for people who are doing resistance training following a ketogenic lifestyle. Uh, and that's because they're, they're efficient. They can actually work with a lot higher intensity uh, with using their own fats. So we don't need so much uh, uh, sugar or glucose to fuel our exercise. Um, so I think it's actually, uh, it's a very good uh, strategy. Uh, we've got one hand up, but I just want to read a question from Tim or a comment from Tim before we go to the Zoom user that's coming up there. It just says Zoom user, so I don't know who you are. But Tim has just written, increased protein, lower carbs can help reverse type 2 diabetes and make type 1 more manageable. More info at and evidence on phcuk.org.uk, public health collaboration. So that, that's in the chat for anyone. Most probably you can all read that. Uh, there is also, uh, I mean, a lot of research and evidence uh, that um, really lower carb diet um, is the easiest way uh, to lose, uh, to treat diabetes. Brilliant. So. Um, a Zoom, whoever Zoom user is with their hand up. Hello. It's Zoom. me. Sorry, Gray. <laughs> Sorry, it's Gillian. <laughs> it's Gillian, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Under <laughs> <a> disguise. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I just wondered, um, you know, whether you tend to, if we're thinking about muscles of the whole body, if there's any area, certain key muscles that are most important and whether, you know, like when you go perhaps to, to do resistance training, some people might just work on the upper body and then the lower body and separate them off. Or, and I just wondered if you have any, um, you know, suggestions or, or preferences for whether you do full, you think about your full body or whether you just zone into certain muscle areas? Yeah, well, great question. Actually, I think the, the latter. So we, we focus on full body exercises, which makes it actually a lot simpler to implement um, just because it's actually 
less mm -hmm. time, right? So, uh, for, and that's why, at least in my practice, I uh, tend to focus on uh, or to, to combine yoga with um, calisthenics. So this actually brings for me a way, an easy way where you can train your whole body. So I, I never do personally any, just take some dumbbells and just to do some um, curls just to uh, work on my biceps. There are many other ways that you can work on your biceps while at the same time working on your back and core and uh, legs, etc. cetera. Um, for example, a, a great exercise uh, is just uh, holding a plank, right? So plank actually works on everything. Hold, try to hold it for with proper form for a minute and uh, you'll feel uh, your whole body, uh, yeah, burning up. Mm. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I, I would actually even suggest that this is the only way you should train. So breaking it up, unless you're doing really specific things for specific goals, um, is too complicated. I, I also think from that point of view is like, if you say I'm, I'm training my, my upper body, it's like you lose that disconnect between, are you not thinking about your lower body? The body doesn't see itself in individual segments. It's, it's, it sees itself as one unit. And you might be doing a bicep curl, but how are you balanced and stable on the ground when you're doing that bicep curl? So I, it does make me grin sometimes when people say, well, I, I'm only working my legs today. It's like, hmm. <laughs> Tim had his hand up and now he's put his hand down. So I don't know whether it was, oh no, it was Kerry. Was it Kerry who had the hand up and then put the hand down? So I don't know if Kerry's still got a question. Yeah. My, my question was answered actually because I was asking something similar. So that's why I put my hand down. Thanks very much. Brilliant. I think we've got through the questions unless anybody else has got their hand up. Um, it's important to have some kind of, Julie is saying, it, is it, sorry, important oh, okay. to have so some kind uh, of protein uh, within 30 minutes after a workout? So the answer is no, actually. And uh, so we're very, uh, the body obviously, once it finishes the, the exercise, craves for energy. So energy, both in, in whatever source uh, or form it is, uh, protein foremost. Uh, but uh, when we're doing strength training, uh, just going back to the presentation, the body and the muscle will try to repair and grow for the next two days. So um, having it uh, 30 minutes after is perfectly okay, but having it two hours as well will not, or even later, uh, will not in any way, say, perform, hamper your performance or the growth of that muscle. So that's, and also that a lot of people actually train fasted in a fasted state. Um, so they can train maybe eight o'clock in the morning and have their lunch at 12 and uh, that works perfectly fine. So I, I have not seen any evidence that uh, there is any uh, less muscle protein synthesis or outcome uh, because of not um, eating 30 minutes. I would even say actually just to bring it a bit different uh, that also um, you need to, re uh, to, to cool down as well. Right, so digestion, so when you're doing really a strenuous exercise, you're really in a fight or flight. You have a, a increased uh, cortisol. That means actually that uh, digestion has slowed down. So if you eat 30 minutes after or 15 minutes after because you're at the gym and you have your protein shake, uh, then actually this is not uh, so easily digested by the body. So I would say that uh, the minimum or roundabout, if you want to eat after your workout, keep it for an hour. Just ensure that you're relaxed. Uh, you have your heart rate uh, down and really you have uh, recovered from the exercise, which means cortisol is lower. Right. Excellent. We have no more questions at the minute. So yeah. let's uh, let move on to a couple more slides, if I may, Gray. Yes. Uh, okay. So what are the next steps? Uh, I would like to invite you all. Uh, to do together with me a uh, yoga session uh, on Sunday, 11 uh, UK time, a session which will be uh, an introduction session, which will be accessible to everyone. Uh, so let's call it the beginner level, uh, but uh, we'll create some heat. So I think we will all find it interesting. Uh, for uh, this audience and for Gray's audience, uh, I'm also giving a 50% off. Um, just use the, the coupon uh, 
Yoga 50, uh, if you're interested. And if that really picks up and there is uh, interest, okay, Gray posted the link. Thanks for that, Gray. Um, so if that's uh, if that picks up, then we will make it a, a, a regular session. So uh, um, starting from maybe in a couple of weeks time, we'll make a weekly session, uh, which will lead up to September. And I'll explain why. Uh, and then uh, that uh, session will also be recorded and available for you and uh, to actually um, train it or do it at your own time. Um, and this will be a progressive, let's say, uh, overload with an intention to flexibility, but also strength. Um, in the way I practice, and uh, yeah, we'll be doing it uh, up until September. And the reason uh, is we're planning a space and tranquility retreat, which is focused on cardio and strength. So uh, we'll really uh, make it super exciting in a four day event for you guys, um, where we'll be having uh, a lot of things to, to for you to learn, experience on cardio, strength, breathing, Qigong, obviously what Gray does uh, so beautifully. And uh, on my side, uh, I'll be also uh, helping you learn and experience what keto and fasting is. So if anybody's um, seen the pistol squats you're doing on the, on the beach there, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and I'll yeah, post so, uh, to that as well out there. Uh, on the on the uh, chat as well to the retreat if anybody wants any more information on that great and uh yeah i'd like to thanks uh thank say thanks to gray and to all of you for um yeah allowing me to to share my knowledge share my thoughts on this topic i think it's a really important topic and I don't know if we have time to discuss more. I even lost track of time. Actually, we're around about the one hour. It's good time. Uh, right? It's bang on time. two o'clock. I mean, if anybody has got any questions, if I don't know, Paniotis, if you're still, if you're free, still just for... Yeah, I, I, I have uh, five or ten minutes. Sure. Thanks, uh, El. Thanks, uh, Julie. Thank you. Debbie said thank you. Excellent. So lots of people having to run off for work. So I think we will finish it. There's so many fascinating, so many great questions and so much good information there. We'll have a playback of this as well. So, I mean, I, will, I want to watch the playback because there's so much I wanted to take in there. So I'll make sure you all get a link uh, to the playback as well. And Panayotis, thanks ever so much for joining. I'll be at the yoga yeah. class 11 o'clock on um, Sunday morning, UK time. Uh, and obviously I'll be at the retreat in September. But interestingly, I had a couple of clients who were asking about, because they're vegetarian and they were asking about coming on retreat um, from a vegetarian point of view. Uh, so yes, we, we can cope with that. So brilliant. Thank you all very much yes, for your time. We, we um, will. Sorry, it's breaking up a little bit here. My, my internet is going a bit, but thanks very much, very much everybody. Thanks Paniotis. And we'll, we'll catch up soon. Thank you. Thank you.